Before I begin, I want to shout out Spunky the Nutcase. Such a quality name. Anyways, this took place in the summer of 2019. Like any adventures of teenagers, the routine was wake up, ride bicycles, eat lunch, ride bicycles again, then watch a movie to end the day, then repeat for at least 60 days. But this one day was different. My friend and I were hungry, so he decided to stop at the local McDonald's for dinner and bring it back to his house to watch a movie. At this time, we were hyped for It 2 to release, and we were already prepared for Halloween. But at McDonald's, a middle-aged, short, mysterious-looking man walked into the store and sat parallel to us. We didn't think much of it, and we let it be. Once they called us for our order, we ended up leaving. When we were riding our bicycles back, Alex recognized the man in a zookeeper-like suit about 70 yards behind us. We sped up a little bit, and we thought we lost him. Or, so we thought. Now, Alex's house is very unique. He has a window right behind where his TV is, and he can see a lot of the neighborhood from that window. Well, 20 minutes into our movie, we're into our goodies, and Alex again points out the man from the McDonald's, walking down the road in our direction. You think he sees us, Alex? Get down! Alex said. Do... do you, do you think he saw us? I stated back nervously. Probably not, but... Let's go check. We peeked up from the ground, but nobody was there. Now, Alex's mom was home, but we didn't want to annoy her. Ten minutes later, I'm going to go get some water from the garage. Suddenly, I look back, and the man with the sunglasses has a smile, and he's looking right at us. He pounds at the window, and we get Alex's mom. She doesn't believe it, and of course, when we go back, he's gone. I wasn't comfortable going home, as I would have to ride my bicycle. So I decided to sleep over, and this is when things really went downhill. Alex and I were still aware the man was still out there, and could still even be on the lookout for us. At two in the morning, we hear a rock hit the window. Oh no, Alex mumbled to me. We peek out the window to see nothing except the darkness of the night. But this next part is most disturbing. All of a sudden, we hear the back door open. Oh golly, Alex said. I didn't lock the door. So we armed ourselves with Nerf guns, just as a precaution. Now keep in mind, these are modded from the 6th grade, and these things could leave a scar and travel at a fast speed. Alex is on the phone with the police, and we're hiding in his room, where we could get the man from two angles if he came in. When the police arrived, they searched the property. They find nothing. But they did find a butcher's knife in a paper that said, I'm not done yet, with a smiley face. We haven't heard of the man since, but I'll update you all if something comes up. Go back to sleep. Boy, oh boy, do I have an experience to share with all of you today. This happened earlier this year during spring break. For quick reference, I'm a sophomore in college, and I live with one other roommate, who we will call Samantha. Anyways, I was working the night shift at McDonald's, and I didn't get home until almost 1 in the morning. By the time I arrived, I'm exhausted, tired, eyes heavier than a 100-pound dumbbell. I couldn't wait to get into bed. But before I did so, I stepped into the shower to try to get the smell of grease and french fries off of my skin. While I'm in the shower, I heard the distinct sound of my bedroom door being open, followed by footsteps. Assuming it was Samantha, I call her name, to which I get no reply. It was a bit strange, since she normally would respond, but I assumed she was just grabbing my phone charger. She had told me earlier in the morning that hers had stopped working, and thus I told her she was free to use mine. As for not responding, I explained this away as the sound of the shower muffling my voice. So about ten minutes later, I step out of the shower, I dry myself, and I change into my pajamas, and finally... I lay in bed. Here's when I noticed something. My charger was still plugged into my outlet. Well, that was funny. I look around my room trying to see if perhaps Samantha had grabbed something else. Everything looked untouched. Hmm. Strange. Maybe I'd imagined the footsteps. Either way, I knocked out almost immediately. Now, I don't know how long I must have been out for, 
but at one point, I was awoken by movement in my bed. Just so you know, I have no pets, and Samantha has her own bed. Thus, I found the movement quite bizarre. I slowly opened my eyes, and what I saw laying next to me was one of the scariest sights of my life. There, staring back at me with one of the most confused expressions I'd ever seen, was a homeless guy. I was still someone out of it, but I do remember mumbling, Who are you, and what are you doing in my bed? I recall a simple reply as the man whispered back, Go back to sleep. Hearing that, I snap out of my drowsiness, jump out of my bed, and I grab the pepper spray that was on my nightstand. Who? Who the hell are you? Get out of my house! Now! The man pretty much noped out of the bed. He ran out of the room, and seconds later, I hear the front door slam open, and then close. Once I no longer heard him, I head over to Samantha's room, only to see it was empty. I now had clarification. I'd heard footsteps in the shower, and it wasn't Samantha. Funny enough, she texted me just five minutes after the homeless man ran out of my home. She told me she was going to stay at her boyfriend's house. Well, once I told her what happened, I call the police, and they take my statement when they got there. To this day, I'm absolutely frightened any time I'm home alone. They never did find the man, but I just hope he never shows up again, because next time... I'll have no problem using my pepper spray. Edit. A lot of people were wondering how the man had gotten into the home to begin with. I forgot to include this, but we have a two-car garage that's attached to our home. The garage door is the kind you use a remote in order to open. Sadly, it had been broken, and we had to resort to opening it by hand. This meant that the homeless man probably tried opening it out of curiosity, and he managed to successfully make his way inside after closing the door behind him. I believe I'd forgotten to lock the kitchen door, which is attached to the garage. So, I believe that explains it. I live on a really busy street in my town. The street I live on connects to the highway, and many cars pass through here even in the late hours of night. This story has two parts, by the way. About two years ago, I was feeling ill, so I asked my mother if I could stay home. She let me stay home that day with my little brother. I have a large family, and every morning my mother drives us all to school. It was unlike me to stay home from school, so my mother was giving me the special treatment. All his kids packed into the car, and she took everyone to school. That day my mother had a few errands to run, so it did take longer to get home. As we pulled up to the driveway, my mother and I noticed the front door was wide open and blowing in the wind. My mother looked back at me and my little brother with a look of panic in her eyes. She reached over and clicked the lock button, and all the doors of the car locked. She then pulled out her phone and called 911. They told us to stay in the car, but curiosity got the best of my mother, and she got out of her car. Slowly, she went up to the back stairs and into the back patio. All the doors were glass, so you could see right into the kitchen and patio. She placed her hand onto the door handle, and a loud crash had come from inside her house. The sound frightened my mother that she runs back to the car. She then locked the doors once again, and we waited for the police to show up. Eventually, two police cars pulled up into our driveway, and they searched throughout the house. But they came out and told us nobody was in there. So my mother got us out of the car, and we all went inside the house. It was weird because the person hadn't stolen a thing. They had only moved items around. The computer monitor was flipped forwards, and movies were pulled out from the bookshelf. Some of the cases were opened, and discs laid on the floor. I didn't really think much of it, so I laid down on the couch in the living room. My mother was in the kitchen talking to two of the police officers, and I was intently playing a video game on my Nintendo DS. That's when I hear footsteps coming from the staircase in the next room. Suddenly, a man dressed in all black had walked down from up the stairs and was now looking at me. He took his index finger and dressed it against his lips. He quietly made a shh sound. I screamed for my mother and she ran into the room with the two officers. The man hurried out of the front door that was still open from earlier. The police officers then followed them outside and I don't know whatever happened after that. 
I was in tears and my mother was hugging me tightly. I don't think they caught the guy that had come into my house that day. A year later, I was home alone with my older brother. It was late at night and I was downstairs watching TV by myself. My mother was out with some friends and she told me to go to bed early. I was supposed to be in bed, but instead I was watching TV. That's when I hear a noise come from the kitchen. The back door was pushed open and I heard footsteps. Now, we're the kind of family that believes in the good in all people, so we hardly lock our doors. Plus, my mother would often come home wasted, unable to find her keys. The sound gets louder as it gets closer. I could then feel my whole body fill up with fear. The person had opened drawers and thrown them to the ground. After that, there's silverware crashing to the hardwood floor, and I sat on the couch scared to move. The person went into the second living room, which was down a flight of stairs. My older brother's bedroom was in the basement, which was off of the kitchen. He comes up from the basement, and he quietly made his way into the living room where I was. I was still frozen in fear when he grabbed my arm and pulled me off of the couch. We then run up the stairs to my bedroom, and we lock the door. My heart is beating out of my chest, and I started crying. My brother told me to be quiet. I could then hear the worried tone in his voice. Now, just a quick note. My brother is notorious for pulling pranks on me, but something told me deep down that this was no prank. He keeps his hand on the door handle in case the man had come upstairs. The sound continued from downstairs. Plates, bowls, cups were thrown to the ground. After ten minutes of this, the sounds had stopped. My brother and I sat completely still against my door, until suddenly we heard him right outside the door. The man first knocked. Seconds after, he tapped and ran his finger down the door. Tears trickled down my face as the man quietly made a shh noise. In that very moment, I knew exactly who this person was. Flashbacks from a year ago had floundered in my head. Eventually, he goes down the stairs, and my brother and I sat still for almost two hours. My mother finally got home and found us in my room, pale white from what had happened two hours earlier. Around four months later, we moved out of the house, and we now live in a different town. I try not to think about this story, because it still haunts me to this day. I'll never know who the man was, nor why he went into our house. One thing I do know is the sound of the shh still gets to me to this day, especially if it's from a man. This story happened a year ago. I was living with my then boyfriend, now fiancé. Anyways, we lived in a townhouse in the suburbs. Pretty safe area. There had been some robberies a couple blocks away, but they weren't common, and I felt pretty safe walking home alone at night. So one weekend, my boyfriend's brother Marshall and his girlfriend Amy and her brother Curtis were visiting. We were all just going to chill and have a couple of drinks and play video games and relax. My boyfriend had his LSATs, and after a couple of months of studying, he wanted to just relax before the exam. Unfortunately, I ended up getting very sick. It was the worst flu I've ever had. Extreme fever, one degree higher than I would have had to go to the hospital. I had nausea, headache, body aches, and all that good stuff. Of course, I didn't want that to stop my friends from having a good time, so they came over anyways, and I just stayed in my room. They went out to eat before they came over, so I was in bed alone watching TV. Felt like I was dying. I slept on and off. About 4 p.m. I heard the door open and figured they were back, but when I called out for my boyfriend, no one came up. Even if he was there, he probably wouldn't have heard me, but I knew he would come and check on me as soon as he came back. So I assumed I heard something fall or the neighbors making noises, so I dismissed it and went back to sleep. I was in a deep sleep and groggily opened my eyes and thought I saw a figure move across my room. I was so heavily medicated and so sick I didn't fully understand what had happened and what that meant. Like I saw a figure, but didn't connect in my brain that I might have seen someone since it was pretty dark in my room. I think part of me thought it was just the TV. Finally, around 7pm, everyone comes back. They were loud. Amy, my boyfriend's brother's girlfriend, was tipsy. She's very fun when she's drunk, so there's a lot of laughter. My boyfriend comes in to check on me. He brought me some soup. He sat and talked about his day as I ate. 
I asked him to look in the basket under the bed to get a new bottle of aspirin. We had a full size bed and I had a basket under the bed where I kept extra pill bottles, shaving cream and stuff like that. I didn't know right away, but thank God he looked under the bed. He put his head up and handed me the aspirin, but his facial expression had changed like he had lost color in his face. I didn't think much of it and said thank you. Come on, I'm gonna take you to the bathroom. He never stutters like that, but I remember picking up on it. I told him no, I didn't really have to pee, and I didn't feel like getting up. He said, no, let's go. I don't want to have to climb up the stairs just because you need to pee in 10 minutes. I remember feeling hurt by his words, but I knew he was right since I just had soup and half a bottle of water. He walked me downstairs, and I couldn't understand why he didn't just use the upstairs bathroom. I think I was so sick, I felt too exhausted to question. He sat me down on the couch. What's going on? I practically whispered this. He took out his phone and his hand was shaking. I asked him what was wrong and I'll never forget how my heart sank and I felt like I couldn't breathe when he whispered, there's someone under the bed. Amy laughed so I laughed thinking it was a prank but it felt serious. My boyfriend's brother suggested we get out of the house so we did. As we were leaving we heard a thud upstairs. We quickly left and drove away then called the police. The police came and searched the house and didn't find anyone. He must have known we suspected he was there and left. My boyfriend couldn't give a description. He only saw sneakers. But it was so dark he couldn't really see anything. The scariest thing still leaves me on edge that the police found a knife under the bed. It was a small steak knife but very dull and rusty. There weren't any killings in the area so my friends assumed he just wanted a place to sleep. I'm not really sure how he got into our place but I have some theories. I'm really proud of how my boyfriend handled everything. He's a calm and collected person, but I always assumed he wouldn't be that way in a crisis. I just hope I never see this person again. This happened roughly two years ago, December to be exact, when my parents had been out doing some Christmas shopping. I recall it was snowing that evening, and I was home alone with my cat. Now, I never had a problem being home alone, in fact, I invited the opportunity any time it arose. It gave me an excuse to be lazy, seeing as my parents were, and still are, pretty strict. Seriously, I can't even play video games for long before the dad says, Get off of the game. It's gonna rot your mind. <laughs> Gotta love the parents. Anyways, I was in bed with my cat watching Konosuba on my iPad, when my stomach started to growl. The munchies were here. So, I get up from my blanket and a pillow fortress of a bed, and I start heading over to the kitchen, cat in tow. Once I was in the kitchen, I started preparing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, as my cat jumps up to the counter and stares out the window. Now, I wasn't really paying attention at first, since I still had my AirPods in, but when I paused the episode I was watching, I happened to hear my cat meowing. This wasn't any normal meowing like the kind he makes when he's hungry. This was the kind he makes when he's angry as he started to hiss. I could see all the hairs on his back stand up and he started clawing at the window. Assuming he had seen a wild squirrel, I ignore his behavior and I go to take a seat at the kitchen table. A minute or so passes and he's still staring out the window doing his menacing meowing and his hiss routine. I was starting to get a bit annoyed so I call him over. Nothing. Okay, this was suspicious. Let me see what the big deal was, I tell myself. I head over to the window, but all I'm able to see was darkness. Seriously, I had no clue what was wrong with my cat. Nonetheless, I grab him, and I start heading back to my room. However, I'm interrupted when all of a sudden, one of the motion-activated lights turns on. Nervously, I take a peek out the window. And this was for the first time this evening, I was able to see a man in a black hoodie holding what looked like a bowie knife. My immediate thought was he had seen me, but he just walks over to the other side of my backyard. This was the point where I take out my cell phone and I call 911. 911, what's your emergency? The woman on the other end calmly stated. Hi, yes, I'm calling because... There's a guy. He's got a knife. He's walking around my backyard. C could you please send some police officers? I told her, 
trying to act as calm as possible. Sure, honey. We'll have somebody go check it out for you. Are your windows and doors locked? While I was talking to this woman on the phone, I watched the man disappear over my backyard fence. I thought to myself, thank goodness he was gone. However, things were about to escalate. When I went over to my room and I locked myself in there with my cat, I heard the sound of a window open. Right away, I got the instant chills because I recognized that sound. One of the downstairs windows was notorious for not closing properly, and it was a fear I had ever since I'd seen the creep. The window makes this really loud squeak sound, which indicated entry. I get the courage to quietly open my bedroom door nonetheless, and sure enough, I can hear heavy footsteps walking in the downstairs living room. He's in my home. Are the police almost here? I whispered with a sense of urgency. Okay, remain in your room and don't open it unless the officers tell you to do so. I then remember her whispering to who I assumed was somebody else in the same room as her. Okay, sweetie, the police are there. Whatever you do, stay in your room and don't hang up the call. What happens next was a series of loud yelling between police officers and the guy who broke in. After a few minutes, one of the officers walks up to my room and he tells me it was okay to come out. The lady on the phone told me it was okay to hang up. And soon enough, I'm speaking with the police. Naturally, I had many questions, as my entire living room was a mess. Drawers had been tossed to the ground, and there were a bunch of muddy boot prints. When all was said and done, the man was arrested, and I was left with quite a bit of paranoia. By the way, the man had used the knife to slash the window screen of that one window I mentioned. That's how he managed to get inside. I believe he was scouting my home, which might explain why my cat had been acting funny 30 or so minutes before he broke in. Nonetheless, my dad installed iron bars on all the windows, and we got an alarm system. We haven't had any issues since. I recently moved out of home and a couple towns away into a new home with my best friends. There's four of us, and I'm the unfortunate soul that works the second shift, while the other three work the first shift. So I really only see them during the week while they're sleeping. The first day of unpacking, I looked outside the kitchen window at the house across the street from us. It seemed like a family with a teenage girl. From my view, she looked no more than 16 or 17. When she stepped outside, she looked fairly normal. She had very fair skin and dark hair. I continued unpacking, not thinking anything, until I looked back outside. She was sitting there on her porch, on her knees, and her posture was perfectly straight. She had her hair pushed to the front of her face and was sitting there perfectly still. As creepy as it was to see, I still tried to think nothing of it, as I was pretty weird as a kid myself. I hadn't seen anyone outside that house in the few weeks since then until one night I was coming home from work. The other three in my home park in the driveway spots and I park in the street on days when they have to work so I don't have to move for anyone early in the morning. The house however sits on a curved part of the street and our next door neighbor drives a utility truck for work and he parks it on the side of the street as well. So it takes me a while to get my car parked. When I come across the corner, I saw the man, who I assume is the dad of the family across the street. He's standing out in the driveway, staring out into the trees. I thought to myself, it's 11 at night, so what could he possibly be looking at in the trees that couldn't wait until tomorrow? It being summertime, I had my windows down so I could hear talking, but wasn't sure where it was coming from, and no one was outside on the street except me and him, it seemed. He didn't seem to be on the phone, as he was just standing there with his arms crossed, looking straight up. Then I heard it. Loud laughter. <laughs> Not just laughter. Full-on cackling laughter. It started out of nowhere. It didn't slowly start. It started very suddenly and loudly. Then I realized she was in the tree. The girl from before was in their tree at 11 o'clock at night, full-on Billy laughing on God knows what. I watched the dad walk back to the house, open the door and look in, still not talking to anyone. But over his shoulder it looked like the walls were stripped down to their studs. She stopped when he walked away, but as I closed my windows and locked my doors in my car, he walked back to the tree and she started right back up like she had never stopped. I walked straight up my driveway and into my house and didn't look back. 
Every night when I pull up now, I'm unsure what else I will see. But all I can say to the neighbors across the street is, let's not officially meet. My boyfriend who I live with works as a teacher in town about 15 minutes away by train. He gets home more or less at the same time every day, give or take an hour or so. I on the other hand work from home. In late January of this year, we had gotten into a pretty big fight about something stupid. I can't even remember now what it was about, but it was one of those fights where we didn't speak to each other, text, call, or anything for the whole next day. So this afternoon I was laying in bed, getting work done. It was a Tuesday, and I'm pretty sure his last class finishes at 1pm on Tuesdays, meaning he should be home around 2.30. But around 1pm, I heard the front door open and shut. I thought, huh, I guess he's home an hour early today. It was normal for him to skip his last class every once in a while, so I didn't think anything of it. In fact, I was mostly mentally preparing for the awkward post-fight, hey, how's it going, conversation. So I continued to lay in bed and do my work and wait for him to come in and change his clothes. The bedroom door was closed and I had earplugs sort of half in, as I usually do when I'm working. But I could hear heavy footsteps of him walking around the apartment, as he always does. If we hadn't been in mid-fight, and if I wasn't so preoccupied with the awkwardness of it all, I might have noticed that it was strange how slow the footsteps were, and how long he spent walking around the living room. But I was caught up in the dramatics of the fight, and didn't think about it. I was just laying there, waiting and waiting for him to finally come in. Finally, the bedroom door slowly opened just a few inches. I turned my head towards the door and prepared to give him a sort of awkward, we've been fighting 24 hours, huh, smile. But the door didn't open more than a few inches. I looked and saw that it was a woman's hand with red nail polish on the doorknob. Whoever was there slowly closed the door just as they had opened it without entering the room. I jumped out of bed ripped out my earplugs and sort of froze there for a few seconds while thinking rapidly. My first thought, that was not my boyfriend. Then I thought, could it have been his mom, his sister, the landlady? For some reason I concluded that it was surely the mom or sister, so I opened the bedroom door and walked into the living room. There wasn't anyone there, but the room smelled heavily of woman's perfume. Then I came to my senses and realized his mom and sisters don't have keys and had never came over before. The landlady never entered without permission. This was a stranger. I ran back into the bedroom and shut the door, now shaking heavily. There's a balcony connected to the bedroom, so despite the cold January rain, I stood on the balcony and called my boyfriend. He picked up and I asked him if his mom or sister might have came over unannounced. No, don't move. I'm calling the police. The police were there in a few minutes and searched the whole apartment. Of course, nobody was in there at this point. It was weird though. Nothing was missing from the apartment, despite keeping a jar full of money right next to the entrance. Nothing was even touched. In fact, it seemed like the intruder came straight into the bedroom, saw my legs on the bed, panicked, and just left. You can't open the big wooden front door without a key. For a few days, my boyfriend and I were convinced that it was a landlady being nosy, and I began to feel a little better. Nevertheless, we demanded the landlady change our locks. When she came to change them with her husband, she made a discovery. There was a square area by the keyhole that had been scratched away with something. The landlady said surely someone used tools to break into the apartment. Then, a day or two later, my boyfriend told me, I have to tell you something, but don't freak out. He told me that the orange kitchen scissors were missing. I obviously freaked out. I tore the apartment apart looking for those scissors. It's been six months and those scissors are gone. So the whole thing is just creepy and weird. A stranger breaks into a nice apartment but doesn't touch or take anything valuable. Not even the jar of money sitting right next to the entrance. Takes scissors from the kitchen, goes straight into the bedroom, sees someone on the bed and leaves immediately. I never got to meet this person who opened the door that day and I hope I never do. This isn't a long story, it doesn't have a particularly climatic ending, but here it goes. So my boyfriend and I were visiting a few friends in Richmond, Virginia. We went with another couple, 
and decided to get an Airbnb. The other couple that we went with picked out the Airbnb, but they hadn't really been in Richmond, Virginia before. So the place they picked was about 15 to 20 minutes outside the city center. Bit of a pain in the ass, but not a big deal. The neighborhood was nice and the house was okay. When we got to the house, it seemed really, I can't really describe it. it, it was nice enough and we were only staying a weekend and the owner left us some banana bread, but there was just this odd vibe to it, a bit of a creepy vibe. For example, when I put our stuff in our bedroom, I opened up the closet and there was nothing in it but a chair, not like a fold up chair but like a small child's chair facing the bed from the closet. No hangers, no other linens, no towels, just a small chair in an empty closet. I know that reading it, it doesn't sound creepy, but I promise you, it was weird. I brushed it off and we decided to settle in and then go and meet up with some friends from the city. Day turned into night, we all had a bit to drink and decided to call it an evening at around 1.30 a.m. The four of us head back to the house and went to bed. Usually, when I drink, there is nothing in the world that will wake me up. My head hits the pillow and that is where I will remain until the sun comes up. So I don't know why it didn't happen this particular night. Maybe it was the fill of the house, but I woke up at around 3 a.m. to a quiet giggle, like a grown man giggle. I thought maybe my boyfriend was just giggling in his sleep, but then the giggling started getting louder, and it sounded like it was coming from outside our window. The window was located behind the bed and above our heads. So I quietly snuck up to see if I could see anything. Nothing. There was no one out there, but it went quiet. The giggling had stopped, so I was about to just go back to sleep. But then, it started back up again. This time, I knew it wasn't my boyfriend, and I knew it wasn't the other couple. The giggling grew louder and louder until it was just full-blown hysterical laughter right outside our window at 3 a.m. I felt my boyfriend's hand clench mine. I didn't even know he was awake. I asked him, Did you bring your gun? No, but I have my knife. He asked if I saw anything out there, and I said no. The laughing stopped after about 15 minutes. We stayed up till about 4 a.m., looking outside the window, making sure that laughter didn't come back. We finally went back to sleep. When we woke up the next morning, we asked the other couple if they had heard anything, and they said no. In fact, they thought we were crazy. One of them suggested that I dreamt it. But how did my boyfriend and I both dream that there was some random person laughing their heads off outside our bedroom window? I can't tell what's creepier to be honest. The fact that we heard that at 3am in this creepy house right next to our window or that when we looked outside there was no one there. I guess you can chalk it up to not being able to see it, to maybe this person being directly under our window. But why would someone do that? Why would someone just stay for 15 minutes outside of a house, giggling and laughing, and then just leave? Nothing happened after that. We went back home. But to this day, my boyfriend and I still bring it up as one of the creepiest things to ever happen to us. So, to the random dude laughing outside the bedroom window at 3 a.m., let's never meet.
My uncle once told me the story about him and his wife when they were on their honeymoon about two decades ago. He said that they had rented a hotel for the night, and once they were about to sleep, they had started to smell a really weird odor, and the bed felt really squishy. My uncle, who I'll now refer to as Eric, called the person in charge of the lobby and requested someone to clean their room early in the morning. Eric was having trouble falling asleep while his wife, who I'll now refer to as Jessica, was already sleeping. Eric decided to take a shower. He grabbed a blanket and decided to sleep on the floor. The very next morning, Eric and Jessica went into the lobby and requested for a manager. Once when the person in charge in the lobby finally called their manager, Eric told them that the room smelled really weird and he would really like a new one. The manager told Eric that all of the rooms were currently occupied, but that he would send a janitor to clean out the room. Eric agreed with this, and him and Jessica then headed out to go spend the day together. Once it was getting a little late, they had got to their room. Jessica had told Eric that she was going to take a shower, so Eric said okay, and while he was on the phone with someone, there was that same nasty odor yet again. Being really frustrated, he wanted to find out exactly where that odor was coming from, so he decided to check the cabinets and everything else. That's when he then got near the bed and noticed that the odor was really strong now. He removed the first mattress and then to his horror, he started to scream. That's when he then saw that there had been a dead body underneath the mattress that entire time. He said that the guy looked around his late 30s. Eric grabbed the phone from the room and locked himself in the bathroom where his wife was taking a shower. That's when Jessica asked him if everything was okay and why he was screaming. Right at that moment, my uncle Eric then passed out. Jessica had to get out of the shower and call 911. Eric had to go to the hospital, but he ended up being okay. The police were already at the hotel questioning the staff on what happened, but they never found the murderer. To this day, it still really makes them sick to their stomach thinking of how they slept on a dead body. That's pretty much the end of it. Eric and Jessica eventually just went to their home and decided to call it a night. They never heard back from the police, and to this day, they still have no idea who was responsible for the body. This happened to me a long time ago when I was a kid. I was home alone one hot summer evening. My parents were out on business and I was enjoying the time alone to do whatever I wanted. Now, we lived in a two-bedroom, first-floor apartment at the time. From the front entrance was a hall that opened into the kitchen. To the left, at the far end of the kitchen, was my room, and to the right of the kitchen was the living room, which connected to a small den. My parents' bedroom was also connected to the living room off to the right. It was around 9 p.m. when I just finished dinner and began my nightly routine of taking out the trash, brushing my teeth, and shutting down for the night. Before retreating to my room, I remember opening all the windows in the kitchen and living room so that the house would cool down over the night. The windows were all barred, so I wasn't really too worried about any funny business happening. Now, I'm a little bit of a security freak, so all the doors in the house have locks, including my bedroom and the bathroom. I shut off all the lights and went to my room to watch TV. Right at around midnight, I dozed off. I had a really weird dream, or rather nightmare, of someone knocking on my door with the knocking getting progressively louder. It was really odd because in the dream I was laying in my bed, but I couldn't move. The knocking got so blaringly loud until I couldn't stand it, then I heard a scream and woke up. My heart was racing and I was sweating a little, but no damage done. I looked around my room and glanced at my alarm which read 4am. Seeing nothing really out of the ordinary, I brushed the dream off and just laid back down. I closed my eyes and suddenly heard knocking on my actual bedroom door this time. A little delirious, I thought I had slipped back into my nightmare. My eyes shot wide open and I just sat up and stared at my door, trying to listen. There were three slow knocks that followed. My very first thought was my parents were back early with food or something and they wanted me to have some. My dad was pretty notorious for knocking on my door when he got home late at night to check on me, sometimes without even calling my name first. 
I always told him that it really spooked me out and he should announce himself when he knocks, but he always forgets. I got up and began walking towards the door, but something felt wrong. When my parents come home, there's usually commotion. They might be having a conversation or I can hear their keys jingling, my mom's heels, footsteps, something. This time, however, it was dead silent. I stopped halfway to the door and then called out. Who is it? Who's there? No answer. I opened my mouth to call out again, but before I could get the first word out, there were several rapid knocks on the door. Very persistent knocks as if it was an emergency, and whoever was on the other side needed to get in now. I felt a lump in my throat. My mind was racing and the first thing I thought of was that what if it was my dad on the other side and he's in some kind of trouble? What if he's choking and can't speak? What if he needs my help? I was frozen in place and couldn't move. I then said, Who is it? Who's there? Once more. Again, nothing. Please say something. Please tell me who it is. It's not funny, I said. A few moments of silence went by. Suddenly, it was as if someone just threw their whole weight into the door. Rapid loud bangs began attacking the door. Kicks, punches, it was as if there were three people on the other side trying to bang the door down. It was so loud that I started crying. I found myself jumping backwards and crawling to the corner of my room. The violent banging went on for a few more moments, and then silence. I sat in the corner, frozen. My hands were covering my mouth and tears were rolling down my cheeks. I thought this was the end. I was absolutely shocked the door stood still because when I heard the first bang, I thought the frame would come crashing down and whatever was on the other side would instantly enter and end my life. I sat there for a period of time that felt like an eternity. Suddenly I heard clinking, the sound of metal brushing into each other. I knew that whatever was on the other side was going through the silverware drawer. If my life didn't end already, this was my last chance because I knew I wouldn't get another one. I sprang up and climbed under my dresser sitting against my window. I threw open the curtain and shoved the window down, and then climbed out as quietly as I could. I fell to the sidewalk and ran to the police station down the road. I was absolutely hysterical and told them what had occurred. Later that night my parents were called as they did an investigation of my house. The only things out of place were a cigarette butt left at the base of my bedroom door, and there was also a butter knife on the kitchen table. In the following months, we moved out of that apartment, and thankfully I can say that was the most excitement I'd ever been through. I soon went to college, graduated, moved to a new state with family nearby, and life is continuing as normal. I'll never know if it was a prank that night or if someone was actually out to get me, but whatever, whoever you are, let's definitely never meet. Okay, so this happened about a year ago. I'm in a long distance relationship and I often fly to visit. I didn't have a ride arranged to come and pick me up so I usually just use a Lyft or Uber to get to and from the airport. This particular ride started off fine. It was a guy from Haiti and he had a very thick accent that was often hard to understand. The beginning of the ride was just him making small talk like most drivers do. Where are you flying from? Are you in college? Do you have family here? And so on. We get on the freeway and there's a lot of traffic. I had a layover flight and of course all of the outlets were in use so I couldn't charge my phone. I'm really hoping that this traffic lightens up soon because I really need to keep in contact with the people I'm going to be staying with. Of course, with my luck, the app crashes and then says, You have arrived. While we're literally in the middle of the freeway near no houses at all. I get kind of annoyed and the driver says that he'll pull over at this Walmart that's nearby so we can try and figure out what's wrong. Apparently he had a very old phone and it wasn't giving proper directions, so I said that we could use mine but that I needed to charge it. He asked me to sit up front so that it was easier and I thought nothing of it so I decided to go up front. He tells me that he'll take me the rest of the way for free without using the Lyft app. I put the address in my phone and we're back on our way. As we're pulling out of the Walmart parking lot, he then decides to ask me how old I am. I told him that I'd just turned 18, and that's when things got kinda weird. 
He seemed to lighten up at how young I was, which was a bit odd, but whatever. He then asked me a series of questions like, Why don't you live here? You should move here. You should go to college here, so why don't you? I'm a doctor and Lyft is just a side job for me, so I have a lot of money. This man was at least in his mid-40s. I told him that I had no money to just randomly move states and start college, seeing as I had just become a legal adult. He then told me, I can take care of you. I'll buy you a little apartment and a nice car, and I can take you out and pay for your college. I thought that he was joking, so I kind of just awkwardly laughed and then said, That's okay, you don't need to do that. But he just kept insisting on it, and I was starting to get really creeped out. I really didn't want to jump to conclusions. I thought that maybe he's just not sure how to hold proper conversations since he's foreign or something. About 20 minutes later, we're about 5 minutes away from my destination. My phone kept doing that annoying thing where it's charging then not charging that phones do whenever the charger wires are loose. I had this phone for a really long time so it did this sometimes, and apparently it hadn't really been charging much at all, and then it died. Since we were so close to the destination though, I told him that I knew the rest of the way, but I'd tell him to turn right and he'd say okay and then purposely turn left or keep going straight. Literally anything but what I told him to do. Now we're lost because he's literally ignoring everything I'm saying and playing it off as some sort of an accident, and I'm not super familiar with the entire area. I really only knew a small portion of the streets. He tells me that he lives nearby, and I start getting really scared because I think he's going to kidnap me or something. I then let out a single tear. I tell myself to keep it together because usually in the movies, whenever they see fear, they usually get mad or something. So I try really hard to try and make it seem like I'm not totally losing my crap. He finally turns back around, and when we're almost there again, he then starts purposely going the wrong way yet again. At this point, I got my phone to about 5%. He reaches over while at a red light, grabs my phone, and then he rates himself 5 stars on Lyft and also friends me on Facebook. He also puts his phone number in my phone and tells me to call him if I ever need anything and that we should go out sometime. I give a little fake smile so he doesn't know that I'm about to crap myself from all of the fear. I eventually get so fed up that I just jump out at another red light and then tell him, Thanks, but you're really scaring me. Bye. I then call my boyfriend on my 5% battery life and I tell him where I am because I'm really scared and I need him to pick me up. The Lyft driver is now shouting out the window for me to get back in the car, but there's no way in hell I was going back in there to be some man's sugar baby and was also a total stranger. I then decide to go somewhere with a lot of people and wait for my boyfriend. Now, this whole ordeal actually made the ride last about two and a half hours, and it should have only taken about 45 minutes, even with all of the traffic. Later, I called Lyft, and I told them everything. He was supposedly fired, so I guess that's good. Anyway, to the random Lyft driver looking for a young sugar baby to try and kidnap, if you happen to see me again whenever I visit, please just stay away from me. It seems I can never catch a break when it comes to encountering scary people. Honestly, I thought that by going on vacation with my best friend Julia in early 2013, we would have had the time of our lives. Though we kind of did. One night in question almost saw Julia and I miss our flight back home. Here's what ended up happening. We ended up vacationing in a popular resort town in Mexico as a way of celebrating her graduation from university. This would put us at both 24 years of age. Julia and I mostly stayed at the hotel, taking advantage of the spas, the swimming pools, the tanning on the beach, and enjoying the drinks that were on tap. Occasionally, we did take a couple of tours during our two-week stay, but one night in particular saw us going to a very popular bar slash restaurant it was just across the street from our hotel, and was themed around caballeros, cowboys, if you don't speak Spanish. Anyways, Julia and I head over there at around 9pm, and we get in line to enter the restaurant, as it was really packed. Finally, 20 or so minutes later, we find a seat at the bar. We both ended up ordering some strawberry margaritas, and some chips with guacamole, 
As we sat there watching people dance and listening to the music, we eventually joined in on the fun, dancing for what seemed like an eternity, while making complete fools of ourselves. I mean, hey, it's vacation, so it is nice to get out of your comfort zone every now and then. During one of the more fast-paced songs, I ended up bumping into someone, causing their drink to spill. Honestly, I expected to be yelled at for my clumsiness, but instead the man, who was dressed sharply in a dark suit, offers his apology, and then he asks me in broken English if I wanted to get a drink with him. Mind you, by this point, Julia was separated from me due to the large crowd of dancers. I tell him I already had enough drinks, but he kept on insisting, saying it was his treat. Come on now, don't be so shy. It's a tradition here in Mexico to buy drinks for others. You don't have to worry. Yes, the man was handsome and he looked nice, but again, I didn't want to trust a stranger. That's why I start to walk away from him, trying to locate Julia. But he ends up walking in front of me and saying something along the lines of, Look, I apologize if I came off too strong. I'm the owner of this place, and it's sort of my thing to treat people who aren't from around here. Alarm bells were starting to ring in my head, but I couldn't explain why. After all, he hasn't given me any sort of reason to doubt him. The only sort of concern I have is that I was in a part of the world where I spoke just enough of the language to make out just a few certain phrases and words. Julia was my translator, and without her... I had this pretty bad confidence issue. Well, I decided to trust the man, and I follow him over to the bar. This was where I meet up with Julia, who asked me if I was ready to go back to the hotel. The man interrupts her conversation, and then he says he'd like to buy us both drinks. Julia then catches up on something that I was unaware of. While I was talking to Julia, the man spoke a couple of phrases to some other men who were dressed just as fancy as Mr. Dancer. I'm going to go ahead and call him that, just to make things easier. Anyways, Julia suddenly says with a concerned tone, Okay girl, I think that's enough for tonight. Let's get going. She grabs a hold of my hand, and we start to briskly make her way out of the restaurant. Slow down, Julia. What's going on? Don't tell me you didn't understand what the man told the others. No? What did he say? At this point, we're just a 30 or so second walk from the traffic light. He told them we were a great catch, and that whatever they did, they weren't allowed to lose sight of us, or they would be in a lot of trouble. Your guess is as good as mine to what that meant, but things weren't over just yet. Out of nowhere, we begin to hear running footsteps approaching us, and we see it's Mr. Dancer and five other men. Hold on. You dropped your wallet, miss. We almost fell for it, but I remembered the only thing on my person were pesos and my passport. This was obvious, which was why we book it to the hotel, half expecting them to follow us in there. Instead, we can see them begin to make their way into a van, where we soon lose sight of them. One of the hotel staff notices that we were out of breath, and then he asks us if everything was alright. We give him a rundown of what had occurred, and suddenly he grows cold and calls over a manager. We were pretty confused, until the manager explained this wouldn't be the first time this has happened. Apparently, it's a pretty common theme for people involved with crime to try and lure and trick foreigners into thinking they can be trusted. Usually, this involves hanging out at bars or parties, where they will try and act nice and try to buy you drinks, or try to get you to follow them to an isolated area. That's where they have fellow partners who are waiting to get you. Julia and I were very creeped out, and we couldn't believe things like this actually happened. Needless to say, we never left the hotel, until it was time to head back to the airport. We have never traveled abroad since. So around 10 or 11 this morning, I was about to go for a run, but beforehand, I was just chilling in the kitchen. I'd already been up for a couple of hours at this point, had breakfast, etc, etc. When out of the corner of my eye, something caught my attention. And when I looked over at it, it seemed that... Somebody with long blonde hair just moved out of view of the window. 
but I tried to look around the corner from both windows that I could look out of and nothing. I thought nothing of it. Could have been my cat or something, but then again it seemed like a different color and it looked uh, more like a head of hair and not a cat. A few minutes later, a couple of my cats were waiting outside a different window, but were looking straight at the corner of the house where I saw this blonde thing move to. I caught the cat's attention, but then they looked right back there, which was strange, but oh well, I just carried on and went for my run. When I got back, my sisters wanted to chat, and they said to me, Hey, do you know what happened with Dad last night? I said no, and they proceeded to tell me that something freaked him out a bit considering what happened that morning. They told me that my dad came into their room at around 11 and asked them, Hey, did you guys bring another girl with? They'd been out at a music event. After my sister said no, my dad went as white as milk apparently. He told them that when my two sisters came up the stairs, he saw a third girl follow them up the stairs, a few steps behind them. They both went into their separate rooms and the third girl paused at the top of the stairs and then proceeded to go into my sister's room. My dad was confused at first but thought it could have just been one of my sister's friends as they usually have some over after these events. But no, it was actually nobody. And the weird thing is that this third girl was also blonde. Like the thing that I saw briefly go past my window this morning. Now, I had not known about what my dad saw and neither did he know what I saw. My other sister then comes out and says that a few weeks ago, she thought, she thought that she saw a blonde girl go across the landing at the top of the stairs outside my parents' bedroom, but as she just woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, she just thought that she was being all weird and stuff. Anyway, our family obviously thinks that this is some really spooky stuff, but do you guys have any suggestions on what we might need to do next. This happened back in 2010. I was working in a hotel in a suburban area. It was a nice place. When I first started there, I was both a part-time front desk clerk and a part-time night auditor. For those of you not in hospitality, I closed a day out on the computers on the overnight shift. I had just been promoted to a day job and had a week left at the front desk before I was switching to my Monday through Friday gig. And it was just like any other night. At about 3 a.m., I received a phone call. The guy sounded my age, mid-twenties, and attempted to strike up a conversation with me. I have to get my name when answering the phone. So he gets my name, of course, and starts asking me personal questions. Do you have a boyfriend? Would you want to go out for a drink? Which were harmless, but nevertheless, I tell him I'm hanging up as I had a job to do. He wouldn't give me a name. Instead, he said, Why don't you call me John? I hang up and finish my shift. The next night, at about 3.30 a.m., I receive another phone call from John. He started off with asking me out for a drink again, to which I declined and hung up the phone. He called back about five times that night, each time getting more loot in his comments and just tried to keep me talking. He ended his last call with the phrase, I see you like singing karaoke. I love doing that. Let's go out together sometime. Shit, I think. He found me on Twitter. I had just gone out a few nights prior with my friends and posted about it. I asked him how he got my full name and he wouldn't tell me. I hung up again and he was done for that night. I deleted my Twitter and Foursquare pages and when my boss came in at 7am I told him what had been going on. We told my general manager and my security guard put it into his report. I only worked two overnights a week. Luckily, but when I came back the next week, so did he. The phone call started around 3 a.m. and lasted for an hour or so, but this time was a little different. John was angry that I had deleted my accounts so he couldn't keep an eye on me and make sure I wasn't cheating on him. 
I told him to fuck off, and that I'm not answering the phone anymore, and that my security guard would be taking all of my calls going forward. The phone was quiet for about 10 seconds, and then he screamed, You're gonna be with me, whether you like it or not! I'm coming for you! And hung up the phone. I, of course, freaked the fuck out and called the police. Luckily, I had my security guard there, so I wasn't completely alone. But it must have been a slow night, because it took the cops mere minutes to get there. I called my night supervisor who left at 11pm, and he managed to calm me down. One cop was nice enough to stay until my shift was done. And with that, I told my boss that even though I had a week left of overnight, I couldn't and wouldn't do it. Thankfully they understood, and I moved to daytime hours, as well as sent an email out to everyone, telling them that anyone who called for me was sent directly to the GM. Thankfully, everything stopped after that, minus a few phone calls the security guy got for about a week. He told the guy that I had quit because of him, and the call stopped. Still creeps me out though. We think he may have been a former guest at the hotel, but I never found out who it was. First off, I want to apologize for any grammar mistakes, as English is not my native language. I'm in foster care, and I recently moved in the basement of a house in a nicer neighborhood. Around the house there are a lot of big houses, but there's not a lot of traffic. My room is in the basement of the house, and my view is into the backyard. There's a motion activated light but it only works a quarter of the time. Anyways, I'm an insomniac, so I'm always up way later than the couple I live with. It was late at night, around 3 a.m., so it was very dark outside, and I was in my room, playing the night away on my guitar. A little lamp was on, and I had a window cracked open. Now I'm not an anxious guy, but for some reason, I felt like something was off, like I was being watched. I brushed it off, because the motion activated light hadn't turned on, and I couldn't see anything or anyone in the thick darkness outside. At some point, I stopped playing and went to take a piss, and as I came back into the room, I noticed that it was way cooler than when I left. Again, I brushed it off, until I saw that my window had been pushed open. There's a security chain on my window, but in my sleep deprived idiocy, I just wrote it off as my cat coming inside to eat while I went to the bathroom. Before I moved in where I live now, I lived in a seedy, high crime area, so I'm always hyper alert at night. After seeing that, I went to take a look just to be safe, and that's when I saw it. There was a person a few meters away from my fucking window. Now, I'm not a big guy, but I've been in my fair share of fist fights and physical arguments, so I wasn't really worried about him beating me up. He obviously knew I'd spotted him, as we had made eye contact before I sprinted for the window. I got there a little before him, but he somehow managed to get his fingers inside before I slammed the window down on his fingers with all my might, hearing a horrible crack as the heavy window hit his hand. He didn't try to retract his hand or say anything at first. But when I cracked it open to do it again, he quickly pulled away and yelped in pain. I secured the windows, and he stood there with his bleeding hand held close to his body, with his eyes firmly locked on mine for about 10 seconds, before he ran off in the direction of the front of the house. I ran upstairs as quickly as I could, 
but he was nowhere to be seen. I woke up the couple, but not before I checked all windows and doors, and they called the police while I checked everything again, and turned on the lights in the house. The police took swabs of the blood on my window frame, but it didn't match anything in their system. No one went to the hospital in a 100 kilometer radius with matching injuries in the following five days. To this day, I don't know who that was that tried to break in, or if he's still around. The thing that bothers me the most is that he didn't run away when I first spotted him, and I don't know how long he'd been out there, lurking, spying on me in the darkness. So creepy garden lurking guy, let's not meet again. And I hope your hand is severely fucked up. My parents live next door to a small red house. Our backyard faces the side of their house, which has a deck and two large windows. Around front, there are always at least three cars parked outside. Oddly enough, in the 10 years I lived here, I never saw anyone enter or leave. Once when I was 12, I saw a shadow thrown against the far wall that was visible through one of the windows. When my sister moved out, I took her room. A large, open converted space in the basement, which had a door and an outdoor stairwell, which led to the backyard. The door had a small window on it, which my sister covered with a Pulp Fiction poster. I redecorated and replaced the poster with some of those sheer half curtain things. The way the room was set up, if I was laying in the bed or sitting on the couch, I was facing the door. When I first moved down there, I noticed that sometimes at night, I would hear the sound of leaves crunching in the stairwell. I chalked it up to my cat, who liked to roam the neighborhood. I had no reason to suspect otherwise, until a few weeks later. One night, while my parents were away on business, my boyfriend and I were sitting on the couch, smoking. Suddenly, he got really stiff and was just staring at the window. I asked him what was wrong and he said, I just saw a camera flash. I kind of just laughed it off and chalked it up to him being high. Who would want to take a picture of two people getting stoned? Still, the seeds of the paranoia had been sown and it wasn't easy to get settled down for sleep that night. I kept looking at the gap between the curtains. There was no light at the bottom of the stairs. So, if someone was really down there, I'd be none the wiser. At around 3, I heard the distinct sound of leaves under heavy boots. Definitely not a cat. I don't know what made me decide the best course of action was for me, standing all of 5 foot 3, to confront the potential stalker myself. I didn't even put shoes on. I threw the door open. There was no one in the stairwell. So I ran up the stairs into the backyard. Standing there was a man in his mid-40s, maybe six feet tall, wearing one of those mechanic jumpsuits. He was holding a clunky, outdated digital camera. We stood there for a second, just looking at each other. He seemed confused to see me. After what felt like an eternity, I remembered how to speak. What the fuck are you doing? My voice seemed to startle him, and he immediately turned. He ran through the backyard, towards the red house, and into the dark. After that, I didn't see any strange flashes of light or hear any crunching of leaf noises. It really freaks me out to think how many nights he could have been standing out there in the dark, watching me. One evening, when I was a junior in high school, my mom and dad went out, leaving me home alone. I had a lot of homework to do, so I spent the whole evening sitting at my desk in my bedroom. My parents left the house around 6 p.m. While I was doing homework, I put my headphones on and listened to loud music. There was a storm that night, and my desk was facing the window, so I could see the rain and the lightning outside. My parents came home around 11 p.m. When I saw their car drive up, I took off my headphones. As soon as my mom opened the front door and came inside, I heard her shout my name. What on earth happened here? She demanded in an angry voice. Confused, 
I ran downstairs. My mom was standing in the hallway with a furious look on her face. She pointed at the floor and yelled, Was this you? I looked down and saw the carpet was covered in muddy footprints. I have no idea how those got there. I spent the whole night at my desk doing my homework. I watched as her face changed from anger to confusion and then to fear. We both realized at the same time someone must have been in the house. We followed the trail of footprints trying to make sense of the whole situation. They started at the back door, which we usually leave unlocked. Then we noticed something else. The footprints started at the back door, but there is no trail of the footprints going back through that door. All of a sudden, we hear a loud, pounding noise that echoed throughout the house. Then the sound of the front door being wrenched open and slamming shut. We all ran into the garage and locked the door behind us. My mom took out her cell phone and called the police. Please come quickly. There's someone in our house. After what seemed like hours, a patrol car arrived with two police officers, a male and a female. One of the officers stayed with us in the garage while his partner went through the house, searching it room by room. When she came back, the female officer told us that there was no one in the house and it was safe to go back in. As we were all breathing a sigh of relief, she asked, whose bedroom is upstairs on the left? My parents looked at me. It's mine, I told the officer. She asked me to follow her. As we walked through the house, we could see the trail of the muddy footprints leading from the back door, through the living room, through the hallway and up the stairs, into my parents' bedroom and towards my room. They stopped at my doorway. The female officer pointed at the door, which had been open the whole night. Scrawled on it in blue marker was the following. 847 I see you. 853. You forgot to lock your back door. 859. You seem focused. 927. Turn around. 947. Look at me. 1015. Look at me. 1037. Look at me. 1049. Look at me. For more than two hours, someone had been standing in my doorway, watching me. To this day, I still shudder to think of what would have happened if I would have turned around. It was around 12.30 a.m. When I go outside to throw away the garbage, and the first thing I see is a woman in her 20s, facing the corner of the wall of the house, as if she was being punished. And the only thing I see is her long black hair that is reaching her lower back. She was wearing a short black leather skirt and sleeveless blouse. It was quite cold outside, so I was wondering if she was alright. She wasn't crying. She was not sad. She was not waiting for anyone. She was just quiet. Hey, can I help you? No response. Are you waiting for someone? Again, no response. Are you okay? She didn't budge or make a single noise. I wanted to tap on her shoulder to get to the bottom of this, but I decided to do that after I threw away the garbage in an unlikely case where she decides to attack me and I happen to have two full garbage bags. I walked around the corner and when I came back, she was gone. My porch was clear. She obviously did not pass me, so she must have went in the other way, and to be honest with you, I was glad she was gone. I go inside the house, lay on my bed, and it's really late at night, and I remember one very important thing. The street was empty on the other side, and no one was there, which means there was only one place the woman could have gone into. My home. I immediately grabbed the honey knife I received as a gift for my 18th birthday, and head out to search for the stranger in my home. I walk around silently, checking each room, under every table, inside every closet, and even in the basement. As I'm walking upstairs, I hear quick heavy footsteps running. I rush to the scene, trying to catch up to this person to confront her. I check my surroundings, and everything seemed okay. I found the front door open with the wind rustling through the gap. 
I go outside and I see the woman in the distance running away, fading into the darkness. She never came back and I never saw her again. Thankfully nothing was stolen and more importantly no one was hurt. This happened a couple months ago. It feels hollow to put a catchy title on what happened to me because it freaked me the fuck out for a while. I was driving home from work at 2 a.m. I'm a nurse and live in a small city. The roads were totally deserted and it was a freezing night. I don't live far from work, maybe a couple of miles. I'm driving down a residential street around the corner from my house and I see a man laying face down in the street. Now remember, I'm a nurse. My first thought was, great, gotta help this guy up. I was coming off of a long shift and falls happen all the time. As I slowed down the car, I suddenly realized what an idiot move this was. I'm a 100 pound woman and I don't carry any weapons. I thought I should do something to help this guy so I called 911 and drove past him and slowed to a stop at the end of the block. While I stopped at the light, I explained to the dispatcher that there's a man in the road that might need assistance. All of a sudden I hear a loud bang from the driver's side window. I screamed and looked over. A man was pounding on my window, jiggling the handle of my locked car. I looked in my rearview mirror and there was no man laying in the street. Still on the phone with 911, I screamed, I'm so scared, to the dispatcher and I floored it through the red light. I quickly told him what had happened, and even though I was right by my house, he told me to keep driving. After a few minutes I calmed down, and he told me to loop back around. I pulled over down the road from my house and stayed in the car. I didn't see the man anywhere, so I got off the phone with the dispatcher who told me he was sending the police car to cruise the area. As I gathered my things, I do a final scan of the area, and I see the man. He's walking with two other men. I hunched all the way down in my car until they were far down the road and then bolted into my house. I don't know if he had ill intent but it freaks the hell out of me that he wasn't alone. Always lock your car doors and carry mace. Seven year old me was playing with a doll that I got for my birthday in the doorway of my apartment on the third floor of a three story building. My dad was outside in the parking lot working on his car as he often did and me playing in the hall was pretty common as I had friends who lived directly across from me who I was waiting for to come home and play with. It was the 80s so being unsupervised was more acceptable. Suddenly this man I'd never seen before walked up the stairs and approached me asking where my parents were. I told him my dad was outside in the parking lot and my mom was at work. I assumed it was a friend of my sister's who was in her 20s as he looked the same age. He said he couldn't just leave me alone and picked me up and threw me over his shoulder. I figured he was overreacting and taking me to my dad, but he made his way to the opposite door from the parking lot towards the side street where his car was. Just then my dad turned the corner as he just happened to have gone over to the other side to secretly smoke a joint and asked the guy what was going on. The guy put me down and said something about thinking I needed help and took off. My dad being stoned didn't really react beyond what the fuck, okay. Kidnapping attempt foiled. My sister didn't know him and she was living with her boyfriend in another city. This happened just a few months ago. I was taking care of my friend's pets while herself and her husband had gone out for vacation. I really didn't want to do it at first since I was busy with school and work, but I couldn't resist the extra cash. Besides, all I really had to do was feed her two parakeets and feed her cat, which I was already friends with. Such a sweetheart. Anyways, I'll quickly mention, she lives in one of those private, closed-off communities where everybody knows each other. It's very rare for there to be a disturbance. Last time I remember her telling me, there were some drunk college students singing karaoke at like 3am. Of course, that was more funnier than scarier. Now, my friend told me I could stay in the guest bedroom if I wished. Going on to further state, any food in the fridge was mine to warm up. She actually prepared me this really awesome chicken alfredo pasta that I devoured like a lion. But I think I'm getting too ahead of myself with all these details. Fast forward to the second night, 
I just got in off of work, and I was going to pick up my girlfriend, who promised to keep me company while I was doing the pet sitting. We pretty much watched movies in the guest bedroom the whole evening, while the cat sat on my girlfriend's lap. I want to say around 3 a.m., I'm waking up needing to use the restroom really badly. I recount the glow of the TV was illuminating the room, and I could hear the slight breeze of the ceiling fan above. I remember I crawled out of bed and I walked over to the guest bathroom. I was in there for about two or so minutes, when I happened to hear a door close in the house. Naturally, at around midnight and with nobody else in the home, I assumed it was my girlfriend getting up to get something. Anyways, once I exit the restroom, she's still laying in bed. However, the cat was now scratching and meowing at the guest bedroom door, which was closed. Either way, I crawl back into bed, but only moments later, I start to hear footsteps walking around in the house. I got a bit nervous, so I shake my girlfriend awake. Emily, wake up. Wake up, Emily, I told her. As she slowly stumbles out of sleep. What is it? What's wrong? I I think someone's... I think someone's in the house. As soon as I said that, more footsteps, and I jumped into action. I quickly went to lock the bedroom door, as my girlfriend was soon on the line with police. Hi, we're calling because we think somebody broke into our home. While my girlfriend is talking to them, I went ahead and grabbed the only thing I could use to defend us. A prop Winchester rifle that was hanging above the bed. A minute or so passes of whispering, when all of a sudden, we hear footsteps right outside the door. I shush my girlfriend quiet, as both of us hear the doorknob being moved back and forth. We've pretty much got chills running down her spine, all the while in the most intimidating voice I could muster up. I shout out, I'm armed, and if you think you're getting in here in one piece, you've got another thing coming to you. The doorknob stops moving momentarily and we both sigh a breath of relief. However, ten seconds later, the person, or persons outside the door, start kicking at it, almost as if they were trying to break it down. Again, I'm shouting, trying to fight back nerves, when we suddenly heard police sirens approaching the street. Damn, they called the police. Let's go. We then heard footsteps echo their way out, before things went quiet. The lady relayed to us that the police had caught the two just seconds after they exited the home. We confirmed this statement, because when we look out the bedroom window, we can see the officers begin to handcuff the two. Backpacks were laying next to them, which we later found out contained valuables stolen from the home. By now, we were safe to leave the room, and we met with an officer halfway down my friend's hallway. We explained we had been pet-sitting, and they told us it was good we had called when we did, it turned out, the two that had broken in were recently released from jail after robbing a bank some time ago. Nonetheless, we had quite a scare that evening, and I admittedly get nervous whenever I hear a noise when I'm home alone. Hopefully, you'll never have to experience something like this. This happened about seven or eight years ago, so some of the details are a bit fuzzy. I would have shared this story ages ago. But it's only been until recently, a month ago, that I discovered there's a community here on YouTube where people can share their own personal scary stories. I really love that, as I think it brings people together from all around the world. Speaking of bringing people together, I want to take you back with me when I used to be on the track and field team. Now, because of the constant training, quite often participating in the sport during normal school hours wasn't enough. This meant I would go for runs on the weekends, usually once in the morning and once in the afternoon, right as the sun was setting. During a time, I had sprained my ankle after falling down some stairs, so I had to take things a little bit easy. This meant that instead of running, I went on short walks around the block. On one of these many light walks, I just got in a brand new iPod for my birthday, and I loaded it up with hundreds of songs. I told my parents I was going to head to the park to feed the ducks, before coming back home for dinner. On foot, it's about 10 minutes. Nothing out of the ordinary happens at the park, other than just watching some kids playing soccer. And then when my little bag of duck feed is empty, I throw it away in the trash, and I begin making the walk back home. Here's when things got scary. As I had my music playing loudly, 
I was unaware that following just behind me was a person. I would be made known of their presence when suddenly in the corner of my eye, I see a truck come to a stop. Then a man jumps out and I watch him as he tackles someone onto a neighbor's lawn. This person was in a hoodie and had just been feet from where I stood. Instinctively I was bemused by this sudden altercation. Why in the world would these two decide to play tackle when they were just inches from where I stood? One look at a pocket knife that laid on the grass started to open my eyes to just how serious of a situation I had just avoided. The man that had seemingly come to my rescue snaps me out of the loop by telling me to grab the knife. I do as he says. As the first man in the hoodie is yelling obscenities and he's trying to get away from the truck driver guy. Soon, the homeowner of the home we were standing in front of runs outside and comes to the assistance of my hero. The woman, who I would find out was the wife of the truck driving guy, had already called the authorities, who showed up within minutes. I'll go ahead and summarize things since I feel like this is getting redundant. As I was walking with my earphones, a drunk man was following me. The husband and wife who were driving in the truck just so happened to have seen this. And they were trying to grab my attention, but I was so focused in my own little world, I hadn't realized the danger I was in. This was when the truck driver saw Mr. Creepy Guy take out a knife from his pocket. The rest was history when he came to my rescue. So, to say I was grateful is the understatement of the century. And yes, I know, listening to music with both earphones on in public is the worst idea ever. That's why... I don't do it anymore. This was during spring break of 2007, in my college years. Myself and another friend, who we're going to call Mari, had saved up money to go to Acapulco, Mexico. We stayed at this beautiful five-star hotel right off the beach. We were amazed to the absolute beauty of the ocean, as well as the overall scenery. You'd wake up early in the morning to a beautiful sunrise, and then You'd be met with the ocean's breeze as it pressed against your cherry-colored cheeks. During the daytime, we would hang out at one of the big pools that featured one of those swimming pool bars, the ones that go around in a circle. If we weren't doing that, we would be at the spa. At night, we would attend the entertainment the resort offered. There were games, performances, and even small concerts. It was around the third day of our week-long visit that some resort guests we had made friends with mentioned this really awesome nightclub about a mile from the resort. We had read about it in the hotel's pamphlets, but didn't really consider going, since the hotel slash resort had it all. That evening, we decided to get dressed, and we took a taxi service the hotel offered that dropped us off at said nightclub. There were many people who spoke English, so talking was fairly easy. Now, I could spend the next hour telling you all about the fun dancing and silly moments, but I think you're going to get bored. Instead, let me fast forward a few hours later. It's around 1 in the morning, and we're ready to head back to the resort. For whatever reason, we decided to use one of the taxis that was waiting around the club, instead of calling the taxi service the resort offered. Not that we were even thinking it was a big deal. After all, it would just be a quick drive back to the hotel, and that would be it. If only it were that simple. Our taxi driver was a bit out there. That's the nicest way for me to put it. I told him in my best Spanish we wanted to go back to our hotel, and he just nodded his head and replied in broken English saying it wasn't a problem. When we reached a streetlight he was supposed to have turned at, he instead continued to drive forward. Mari and I looked at each other and thought, well, that was strange. Maybe he got confused. We give it a few seconds hoping he would get the idea, but he continues to drive forward. Um, excuse me sir, but our hotel is back that way. You were supposed to have made a right turn at that traffic signal, weren't you? In his broken English, the man replies by saying, Don't worry about it, it's okay. I know a shortcut. After all, I want to get you back to your hotel as quickly as possible. From that turn, it was only a two-minute drive. So unless the so-called shortcut was faster than that, what was the point? 
I take a look at our maps application. I can see the street we were currently on was continuing at least for another half a mile. It would then head into the city, which we had arrived from when we flew in just a few days earlier. We're starting to get really scared since we're in a city we've never visited before, and it's very late at night. This was the point we were done being calm and respectful. Mari uses her phone and dials Mexico's version of 911. All the while, I'm making it very clear to the driver that if he doesn't turn back or drop us off, he was going to be in a whole world of trouble. Sorry for being anticlimactic, but what happens next is the driver pulls over at the side of the road and just tells us to get out. Bear in mind, two or three minutes have already passed, which felt like a lifetime, and we were just entering the city. We wasted no time jumping out of the taxi as the driver floored it out of there, and then we proceeded to run to a 24-hour pharmacy. Unfortunately, the driver got away, and we don't know whatever happened to him. The police just took her statements, and we then got dropped off at the hotel 30 minutes later. As for the rest of the vacation, nothing else happened, apart from just hanging out at the hotel. Instead of using some random taxi, we paid a little extra and had one of those fancy limousines the hotel offers to take us to the airport. I haven't been back to Mexico since that incident. Can I just preface by saying it's not a good idea to run on a trail at night? Okay, maybe that's pretty obvious. But being naive, you don't really think about things going wrong. After all, if you're like me, you love to give people the benefit of the doubt. This occurred a year ago, when I just started getting back into running long distance. I do have marathons with my friends, but I had started to get lazy on training. This must have been my third or fourth day back into the routine. However, instead of my normal run, which was in the morning, I had to move it till later in the evening, because I had to cover for a co-worker at my job. This means by the time I get there, it's about 7.30 p.m. Since this was in the summer, I had about 30 minutes of sunlight, so not too much to worry about. Now, the trail I run at starts next to a courthouse. Two miles later, you reach a busy intersection. The trail then continues after that for another three miles. But I decided to just do the first two, since again, I'm working with what little sunlight I've got left. During those first two miles, I saw a couple of runners and even people on bicycles, and I gave them a friendly smile and a hello as they went about their night. When I reached that two mile marker I mentioned, I decided to take a quick break to stretch and grab some water from a nearby water fountain. Here's when things got sort of creepy. In the distance, no more than 50 feet from me, I was able to make out a fairly large figure in a hoodie and jeans stumbling through the tree line. I watched them while I stretched and then I noticed they began walking toward me. Maybe they were a fellow trail runner, or maybe someone who was walking. Pretty weird outfit they had, but to each their own, I guess. Anyways, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, which is why I give a quick wave and a friendly smile. Moments later, it's a man walking up to me, and he's asking if I could give him the time. I look at my Apple Watch, and just as I'm about to say something, he reaches for my arm and rips the watch off of me. Hey, what are you doing? Give that back. I try to reach for it, but he moves out of the way, taking out a small knife in the process. I froze, as he then demands I give him any other valuables I had on my person, which I had my ID card and my phone. This was the moment when fight or flight kicked in, and I thought of something pretty risky. I was going to pretend to hand over the phone, but then I was going to use the opportunity to go for a low blow. It worked. Just when it seems he's got his wish and he has his hands on my device, I make my move and connect with his family jewels as he falls to the ground like a ton of bricks. This was my chance. I went ahead and kicked the knife from his reach, which has fallen out of his grasp, and I soon grab it, telling him to stay where he was. Luckily, I wouldn't have to wait too long for help, because in the distance, I see two of the largest dogs I'd ever seen. They turned out to be German Shepherds. 
Well, not only did I have these awesome dogs to thank, but the owners too. One was an active police officer, while the other was a marine, and both were friends going out for a late night run. Anyways, I won't keep you in suspense any longer, but pretty much to sum things up, the guy ended up running away, albeit limping. Thankfully, he wouldn't get away for too long, and he was located by police thanks in part to the description the three of us provided. So that's one less bad person out there trying to rob you. By the way, I now carry pepper spray and a knife for self-defense. This happened a few years ago while I was doing some shopping for my family at a supermarket. For quick context, I'm female, and I'm originally from Minnesota, but I moved to Kyoto, Japan with my husband, where we settled down and we had a family. This is important to mention because I stood out from all the locals. Not that I didn't mind the added attention. After all, everyone here in Japan is super sweet, and thus I'm the same way back to them. Now something else I want to note is that I have just recently broke my arm, and thus I was wrapping a cast that had the names of my co-workers and my kids signed on it. Because, you know, that's the first thing you do when you get a cast. Anyways, I was doing our typical shopping for the week, and I had been in the vegetable section when a man approached me asking if I needed any assistance. As I had my back turned to him, I first thought I was hearing the voice of an employee. However, I soon notice it's just a fellow shopper. No, I'm okay. I think I can handle grabbing a couple of groceries all by myself. He kept on insisting, saying how a beautiful woman like myself shouldn't have to do groceries on her own. I thank him for the compliment, and again I tell him I was fine on my own. But my acknowledgement of his question was like an invitation for him to start asking me more questions. How did you break your arm? if you don't mind me asking. I give him a generic answer hoping he would leave me alone, but then he asks me if I was seeing anyone, which was then followed by asking me if I would like to get a drink with him. I ensure him I was happily married, and I wasn't interested. And this was enough to drive him insane. Why did you just look at me like you were interested, huh? You were giving me hints, now you're telling me it was all a lie? Let me get one thing straight. I had never met this man in my entire life. Not only that, I never even noticed him in the half hour I'd been shopping. Either way, I just begin walking away from him, but he keeps up pace, cursing at me, and calling me all these names. This grabs the attention of a couple of other shoppers who come to my defense. One man in particular who was way taller than this weirdo pretty much told him off. But that's not before a security guard noticed and escorted the man out of the store. Everyone who had been watching let out an audible cheer, happy that this creepy guy was out of our lives. But this was just the beginning of this nightmare. Fast forward approximately 20 or so minutes later to just a little past 8 p.m. and I'm walking by my vehicle, shopping cart in hand. All of a sudden, the creepy man from the store steps out from behind a couple of vehicles, and he says, So, are you happy that you made an embarrassment of me? All I wanted was a chance to take you out to dinner. Once again, I remind him I was happily married, as he begins to approach me, with my shopping cart being my only wall of defense. Without even getting another word out, he takes out a pocket knife and lunges at me, grabbing my good arm in the process. Let go. I already told you I'm not interested in going to dinner with you. Too late. I've already made up my mind. I'm taking you by force. Just so you get a picture, the parking lot is pretty empty, and the lighting is pretty horrendous. In those moments that felt like they went in slow motion, I thought of an excellent idea. Using my arm with the cast, I smack him with all of my might on the side of the head. This was enough to get him to let go. However, I can't even begin to describe how much it hurt when I connected with his noggin. Anyways, I book it and scream like a little girl, managing to get the attention of some shoppers who are exiting the supermarket. By the time I look into the parking lot, I can no longer see the man. This didn't stop me from getting the security guard 
and having him contact the Japanese authorities. Unfortunately, he was never caught, and to this day, his identity remains a mystery. I just started my freshman year of college. I'm going to a college out of my home state and no one I know is going to the same university as me, which means that I'm going to be rooming with a total stranger. Pretty normal, right? Well, that's what I thought. When I met my roommate, who I'm going to be referring to as DJ, she seemed nice enough. Her parents seemed nice enough too. Everything was going fine for the first couple of weeks, but then DJ's odd habits began emerging. I noticed that every time I would sit at my desk, she would always move from wherever she was to sit on the floor right behind me. And I mean every time. The first few times, I thought it was just coincidental because it happened when she would be entering the room from her last classes. I thought that maybe she just wanted to relax by sitting on the floor. Weird, yes, but plausible. But no. Then the other scenarios began happening. She has a beanbag set right by next to me, so close that it's touching me, and this is her favorite spot that she always sits there to do her homework and whatnot. If I decide I want to sit at my desk, she'll actually move from the beanbag and then the floor behind me. Sometimes she doesn't even do anything, she'll just sit there. She abandons her homework to sit behind me. I don't really sit at my desk too often anymore because of this very reason. DJ also has a job that she has to get to by 8am every week, which means that I typically get woken up very early. I usually just roll over and try to get some extra sleep. A couple of times now though, I've actually woken up to DJ staring at me. One time she was about a foot away from the bed and just staring. She also makes a point to look at me whenever she leaves. But it doesn't end there. I'm utterly disgusted by hair, right? Like it actually makes me sick to my stomach whenever I see hair all over the floor. Well, DJ has this really long curly red hair. Which is fine, only she sheds so much hair that I've seen her actually sit there and pull her hair out. Okay, whatever. But one day I decided that I wanted to wash my sheets. I don't even sleep with my sheets. I'll typically only sleep with a throw blanket or only my comforter. I really never go under my sheets, but I do lay on top of them, so they still deserve to be washed. When I pulled back the sheet, I was then met with strings of DJ's long curly hair. I nearly threw up over it. I have no idea how it got there and I'm not really sure I want to know. But hold on, it gets better. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, DJ and I share the same class together. Whenever class ends, she sits there and waits for me to pack up my notebooks and things and then we walk back to our room together. Only here's what's strange, she never tries to talk to me, she usually just walks like about two feet right behind me. By itself, that probably seems kind of normal, but with everything else, it just sort of feels like she's watching me. Perhaps not the creepiest story out there, but still very unnerving for me personally. This encounter happened 13 years ago, and at the time I was 14 years old. My then best friend lived just down the street from me, and my cousin was dating her older brother, so I basically spent every day at her place. She lived on the fifth floor of a block of flats. It had 18 floors, so more often than not I'd just get on the elevator. On this particular day I was waiting on the elevator, and it was taking a while. Not so unusual. As I said, this building had 18 floors, so sometimes you had to wait a while if other people were using it. While I was waiting, a man entered the building and stood beside me waiting to get on the elevator as well. Not so odd, but something about this guy had me very creeped out. I can't say what about him made me so uneasy looking back, as he seemed like just a normal guy. He looked to be in his late 30s or early 40s with short dark hair, medium height and build. Short beard and dress well enough, but something about him just seemed off. I could feel his eyes on me as I continued to wait for the elevator. I'm a girl and I've always been small and looked younger than I was. Back then I was lucky if I was even 5 feet, and I looked about 11 or 12. I've had stranger danger and how dangerous people can be drilled into my head since I was little, and while it seems silly to be this terrified of a random man just waiting on an elevator same as me, 
I decided to still listen to my instincts. It was the best decision I have ever made. I casually walk to the stairwell which is around the corner from the elevator. I walk in and the second I'm out of sight and the door closed, I begin to run up those stairs as fast as I can. Now, back then I was fairly athletic. I did a lot of sports in my free time so it didn't win me too bad to run up those stairs. About halfway up, I hear the stairwell door slam open and footsteps running up the stairs. I pause for a second terrified and look down the stairwell seeing the face of the guy staring up at me from the two floors below before he begins to run up them. I run as fast as I can up the remaining floors, my legs burning from how fast I was running, barely able to catch a breath. I finally get to my friend's floor and exit the stairwell. I get to her door and begin to pound on her door, crying and begging her to let me in. She opens the door pretty confused and I run inside, slamming the door behind me. So there I am crying and shaking as she gets the story out of me. Her older brother who was a 20 year old guy and built really big heard all of this and he came out of his room to find out what the commotion was. He charged out of the flat and began to hunt the building for the guy but he couldn't find him anywhere. I never saw that man from the elevator ever again. I don't know what he wanted me for or what he planned to do if he caught me but I'm really glad I never found out. My husband and I really love to go driving. We prefer road trips, but on the weekends or nights, whenever we have nothing better to do, we usually just go cruising and just drive around. We prefer smooth and not busy roads. On this particular night, we were really bored and decided to go cruising. We went up north to a small town about a half an hour from the city where the roads are really curvy and smooth. This town is pretty close to the mountains, and if you follow this particular main street all the way up north, it starts driving up to a mountain. It's about 9pm and there are very few cars in the road already since it's a small, nice little cute town. But we keep going north, away from all of the houses and stores, and eventually where the roads start curving uphill. We drive for about 15 minutes more and it's pitch black when we see some blinking lights. As we get closer, we see that there's a truck on the side of the road facing us. I'm getting the chills thinking about being all the way out here in the middle of nowhere and there's a stranded truck on the side of the road. As he slowly approaches closer, I tell my husband that it's probably for the best to just turn back and that I had a really bad feeling. But at this point we're pretty much right next to the truck. As he pulls up next to the truck, a young blonde guy maybe in his late 20s comes around and gets next to our window. I get such a bad vibe by this and I tell my husband not to put the window down. I think that he also gets a weird feeling so he actually listens to me. He kinda just loudly asks what's wrong and the guy says something along the lines of something's wrong with this truck and that he might need a hand with it. His phone is also dead. My husband asks what happened but the guy just insists on showing him and to come take a look. He says it very friendly and he even calls him bro and he says that he's really glad we pulled up. My husband tells him, You know what man, I really won't be much help. I don't really know anything about cars but let me call someone to see if they can help you with this. The guy is insisting and he gets visibly upset. I'm looking back at the truck and I thought that I caught some movement inside of the truck. I tell my husband that I really think we need to go. Like now. He probably saw the look of fear that was all over my face because he then put the car in reverse but as he did that, the guy is now right behind our car. He's acting really stressed out and rubbing his face and kind of pacing. So my husband decides to go forward instead. We drive up for maybe about two minutes trying to find a place to turn around since the road is so narrow. The road turns to a dirt road and there's a little more space on the side so he's able to turn the car around. I'm absolutely dreading going back that way now and our phones have no signal at all. In my mind, I mean, I know that this could all really be someone with car problems. Maybe there's a friend in the truck too. I mean, he never said he was alone, but I just can't help the really bad feeling that was in my gut. We soon reached the area where the truck had been, but there's no truck at all. We then drive down maybe another 5 minutes but no trace of the truck and we're absolutely sure that we passed the place where it would have been. Like I said, we didn't drive up too far to begin with. I'm both relieved and absolutely terrified that the truck was no longer there. 
I mean, if it really had broken down, how did they get it to work again in such a short time? Calming myself down, I'm telling my husband, hey, maybe they really did get it to work. Maybe it turned on all of a sudden and they were able to drive off. I mean, it's suspicious, but not impossible. As we keep driving though and the roads are straightening out, we notice far off the truck with all of the lights off and it's parked to the side again, and we notice some movement in the bed of the truck. I say out loud, why did they turn off all the lights? I think that we're still way too far away to see them, but we see two figures get on the other side of the truck and then crouch down as if they're trying to hide. We get closer and my husband floors it. As we drive past, the two men get up. One of them the guy we had spoken to and the other someone else with a very surprised look on both of their faces. One of them runs behind us for a bit and we see them getting tinier in the back. I keep looking back, absolutely terrified, but it's dark back there now, when all of a sudden I then see the headlights turn on in the truck. They then start driving in our direction and very fast. My husband keeps going fast and eventually we finally lose the headlights. I keep looking back the rest of the way so scared that they're somehow still following us. Maybe they turned off their lights again and we just can't see them. Anyway. After driving for a very long time back to the city, we try to convince ourselves that no one's following us. We decide to call the non-emergency line and give them a description of what we saw. No, we didn't get the plates of the truck. It was all so fast and in all of the fear, I just really didn't think to get them. We give a description of the guy we saw and the type of truck it was, but there was really nothing else that could really be done. Now, I realized that all of this could probably be rationalized, but in the moment, we were absolutely filled with terror. I mean, being out there in the middle of nowhere and all the possibilities. They could have been armed. They could have put their truck sideways on the road and left us with nowhere to go. They could have put something out in the road to rip up our tires. And even though it could all have some sort of explanation, there's still so many questions. Why couldn't he tell us what was wrong? How did the truck work again so fast? Why did they turn off all of their lights and why did they hide? It's been about a year and it's just a creepy experience now. We still go cruising, but we usually just stick to a little more civilized areas now. That is, at least for nighttime cruises. About four years ago when I was 15 years old, me and my parents had moved into a brand new apartment and we decided to get a puppy. We would walk him about four or five times a day, but we still struggled a lot with my dog separation anxiety. So I imagine for the first few weeks being there, it must have been hell for my neighbors because he would always bark and cry whenever we left him all alone. However, every time we talked to my neighbors, they would just tell us not to worry about it because they hardly ever heard him and everyone was fine with it. That is, except for Tony. One Saturday, I was home alone and someone knocked on my door. It was Tony. At first, he just seemed kind of somewhat surprised to see me open the door. But then he just smiled politely and then said, Hey, can you tell your parents to come see me when they get home, please? I said yes and then he left. I thought nothing of it. When my parents came home, I told them about my encounter with Tony and my dad went to his apartment, suspecting that it had something to do with my dog barking. Tony told my dad that my dog was a real barker and that he worked during the night and needed to get sleep during the day, so he would really appreciate it if we could find a way to make less noise, although he did say that he understood that he knows that it was hard to control a dog's bark. He also apologized for showing up at our door, saying that he didn't know I was alone in there. According to my dad, they had a pretty nice polite conversation. My father had apologized for the inconvenience and then came home and we did our absolute best to try and deal with my puppy's anxiety. And it worked. My dog of course did still bark but wasn't so agitated as he used to be. Flash forward a few weeks. Every time my dog would sense Tony going down the stairs of our apartment building, my dog would always go nuts. He was a fairly friendly dog towards people but for some reason he just absolutely hated this guy and Tony had stopped talking to us, pretty much ignoring us every time we ran into him, or he would simply just stare at us. One day, however, me and my mother came home and on our apartment door were six holes. It was like someone had punched the door with like a key or something sharp. 
My mother was pretty naive about it. She thought that maybe we had done the damage ourselves throughout the months that we'd been there. That's when Martha, one of our other neighbors, then called my mother really worried about me, then questioning her if I had been home alone during that afternoon. My mom said no and that's when Martha tells us that someone had apparently been banging and kicking at our door while also screaming a ton of insults, making a scene that was so terrifying that her 11 year old son got so scared that he hid under his bed for like 4 hours until Martha came home because he thought someone was breaking into our house. A few weeks later, there was a city fair at night and my parents and I plus Martha and her family headed out to the building to go to the fair. We came back earlier around 11 p.m. It was almost 12 a.m. at this point, and someone had rang our doorbell. My dad went to see who it was, but no one responded. Usually when this happens, we either go to the window to try and see who it is, or we go downstairs, because it's usually the mailman. But since it was midnight, my dad found it very strange, and he didn't go downstairs. He pretty much just ignored it, and we all went to bed. Well, the next morning... My mother runs into Martha and she tells my mom that when they got back from the fair, they found Tony hidden in the dark under the stairs with a freaking baseball bat in his hands. He looked really nervous but said someone had rang the doorbell and he found it really weird that someone would do that so late at night. So he apparently came downstairs to see who it was and with a baseball bat. My mom pretty much immediately knew exactly what happened. He had rang our doorbell expecting my dad to come downstairs and see who it was. I honestly don't really know if his plan was to attack my dad or not, but my father obviously worrying about me and my mother's safety since he wasn't home during the week, then went upstairs absolutely fuming and knocked on Tony's door. When Tony saw my father, I kid you not, he looked like he was about to pass out. My father had confronted him and Tony legit started crying. He told my dad that he sometimes did drugs and he really didn't know what he was doing. He then went on to apologize for actually damaging our door with a damn pocket knife and for what happened the night before as well. He didn't even lie about it. As it turns out, the reason my dog freaked out every time he sensed him and barked so much was well because Tony waited until everyone in the building had left for work and then he would go to my door and kick it, making my dog more furious every time and not so much because of his anxiety. My dad then said very calmly, this is the last time I'm going to talk to you. Next time you come near me or even look in the direction of my family again, I'm going to make my point very clear. Do you understand? The guy kept crying and trying to hug my dad. We went to the police and filed a report, but we finally stopped seeing Tony. Turns out his wife actually kicked him out and filed a restraining order for her and their daughter because apparently one morning she actually woke up with him staring at her and their daughter while they were sleeping and the entire house smelled like gas because apparently he left the stove on. We moved shortly afterwards and we never saw Tony again after that.